Um, we will delay our church meeting a little bit. There are still some things that I need to find out regarding numbers and information like that. So um, we will have that church meeting soon. I'll let you know, but it's not quite yet. We had our men's breakfast yesterday, and Mr. Twitter will talk more about it. But I encourage um, more people who can be there. Sometimes it's you know, the way the schedule works, people can't come, but if you can come, uh, men, a men's breakfast, that would be really neat. We did have a good group, a good time yesterday, so hope that you can make it uh, sometime in the future. Genesis 22, um, verses 1 through 5. We have the act of faith that uh, we all look to as Christians. This is uh, why God chose Abraham. It's why God chose to work through Abraham. It's, it's God's power in Abraham, but he is also the example of our faith because of this chapter. Before I go into it, I want to go to the book of Revelation. The very end of the Bible, we're in Revelation chapter 21. This is from the NIV. And this is after God has accomplished everything that he has been trying to accomplish, at least as far as we know. Obviously, God is far bigger than any kind of box we can put him in. But his goal, since Adam and Eve, was to live with humanity. Um, and in Revelation 21, he is doing that. This is after he creates the new heavens and new earth. This is after he refreshes and renews everything that uh, we have done wrong. The prophet John writes in chapter 21 of Revelation, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice in the throne saying, So from the throne of God, there's a voice shouting out, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no mourning, no crying, no pain. The old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. These words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give a drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all of this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. In Genesis 22, we have Abraham, in this moment, believing all of this. Trusting fully that God is the beginning and the end. Trusting that God would do what he said. That God would be true to his character. That's really easy to say when we're not faced with something that you personally are responsible for obeying or disobeying. It's easy to say until you're in that spot. And here, um, all the words in the world don't really matter until you're in that spot. And then we get to see Abraham in it. We know that he's failed and that he has lived in a kind of unconvinced way from time to time. But in this moment, as he's getting older, he has changed. It's not perfect, but he has changed because he's seen God stay the same. We aren't very consistent, but you can trust that God is. He will do what he said. In this particular chapter, Abraham believes that. When we think of this particular 
episode, this particular story, maybe your thought is, how could God allow something so barbaric, so cruel? And in fact, I've heard this said on the lips of, uh, of people criticizing Christianity or on the lips of Christians who are, who are bothered by the story. Um, this story is so important. I, I hope that if you have that question, you're listening carefully. Um, you have to think through this. This is a must in understanding what God is doing. The question here when you see this kind of image, and if you know the story, you know the image. If you don't know the story, then you don't know it. I guess you'll find out today. I'm assuming most of you have heard it. The question, though, would be, is God really all you need? And we go, oh, yeah, of course. You know, I just sang a song like that you know, weeks ago. But really, but really, <laughs> but really is the all you need. And if you're a human, you're going to go back and forth and be like, absolutely. And then, you know, tomorrow, you're not going to act like that because you're a person and you mess up. But, like Abraham, Hopefully you, over time, even though your sin nature hasn't really changed, you are changing because you've got to see God stay the same. We will often say, yes, God is all we need. But our actions might say no. We can see it. If you live in a Christian community, you go, we'll see people make mistakes funny. Abraham's actions often said, no, I, I don't trust God right now. We've seen that already. We've seen it a few times. And many years have gone by, though, and he's changed. Isaac is now a young man. Abraham has gone a long time. He's had a long time to think about, is God sufficient? Is he all I need or not? He's had a long time to think about it. He's had a long time to think about how much that God has helped him. He's had a long time to think about, man, I didn't trust God that, that time, and it just didn't work out for me. I trusted me, and it's just, it was just a ball of flames. Trusting in his own skill set only. Trusting in his own ability. He's seen the result. He schemed, and then he got something, but it wasn't what he wanted. Now, the binding of Isaac is the final test of Abraham's faith. Um, but the question is, why does Abraham's faith need to be tested? Because it is a test. Why? Is God saying what we believe about God and what God has said about himself, we know that God already knows what Abraham will do. He's already known that. That's why he picked Abraham. He knew that Abraham would finally trust him. He knew that. He knew it before he ever talked to Abraham. So why is he, why is there a test? Why is that necessary? If you're not thinking that question, then that, that would be really odd. I hope you're thinking it. Why do you have to test Abraham when you already know what he's going to do? Why is this necessary? The answer is, is that he doesn't need to know himself. He already does. God knew what Abraham was going to do. God is not testing him because he's curious, God is testing him so that you can see what faith looks like. And he doesn't do this, obviously, with, with you know, most believers. Uh, maybe we're all tested in some way, but this is extreme. This is an extreme test. But it's meant to be a test that the people of God remember for thousands of years. The test. That's a, that is really he's the father to all those who believe in a kind of human way. It is that important. It's extreme on purpose. It's not an accident. God asked Abraham to give up just the only thing that he wanted, the only thing that he, that he left his home and his family to begin with, and that was he wanted a son, a descendant. Remember, though, he's already gave up one. He's already walked to Ishmael, took him by the hand to his mother, and then watched him walk south into the desert. And he would never see him again. He's already done this once, so this will be time for round two. It, I don't think it gets easier. Before this moment, Abraham had 
you know, intermittent faith. He believed it, but every once in a while, something came up that would stress him out, and then he would mess up some. In this chapter, Abraham's faith is, um, as far as we can see, it's just fully in God. I'm sure he's not a happy camper, but he's fully trusting God. There appears to be no hesitation. There is only confident, deliberate action. Abraham will do something that's unusual for, for, for all time. And that is, he chooses the giver instead of the gift. We usually do the opposite. We, we want the gift. And I think that's to be human. It's not like it's actually just expected. You know, I, I, I think that's normal to choose the gift instead of the giver. It's wrong. But it's not uncommon. But Abraham will do something rare. He'll choose the giver instead of the gift. He does it because he believes in God's promises. Because he trusts that God is who he said he was. That he is unchanging. And Abraham only talks just three times. And they're very brief statements. And it's weird because he does a lot more talking when he messes up. In those chapters, it goes on for verses. But in this chapter, it's just short, short little sentences. One time he responds to God's call, once he speaks to his servants, and then once he speaks to Isaac. And all of them are very significant. Pay attention to those times, and I'm not going to really necessarily pause and ask you to think about it. The three times he says something, you go back later after the day and look at it again in Genesis 20. Now, these translations you see at the bottom were done years ago by a friend of mine. I just altered it uh, yesterday, but um, if there's something a little off, well, that, that's all right. The person who did this at 2 a.m. for me years ago, so forgive them. But um, translations on this kind of sermon, I really want everyone to understand. Um, this is kind of the point. Genesis 21. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham. Abraham replies, Here I am. Then God said, Take your son. And very reflective, or rather, New Testament language is very reflective of this. I hope you connect that for yourself. I won't connect it, but this your only son language is used on purpose in New Testament. Then God said, Take your son your only son, whom you love, I, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there to burn offering on a mountain, I will show you. Don't tell him where it is yet. Just get up and start going. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him Two of his servants and his son Isaac. We don't really see any discussions with the family. I imagine he's uh, feeling, at the very best, very sober. And that at the worst, if it's a human like me, kind of numb, maybe in despair. But he does it, he acts, because he believes God's nature, God is who he said he is. God promised a nation would come from. So that must happen in Abraham's mind. It can't happen with a dead son. So he takes his servants and his son. When he had enough wood for the burnt offering, and the burnt offering requires the entire offering to be burnt to ash. There, there isn't anything left. So this is not a small amount of wood. So more than likely, um, Isaac is not, he's not, you know, in elementary school, probably not in middle school, he's probably a, a little bit of an older boy. Because again, to burn up a whole offering requires, even if it's a lamb, you need to have a significant amount of wood. So he's, you know, not the cute little little boy we often see in storybooks, probably in middle school or high school. Uh, old enough to resist, put it that way. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out to the place God had when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. 
Now, this is significant. This is Abraham's faith in this verse here. He said to his servants, stay here. So the boy Isaac will carry all the burnt offering himself again. That's a lot of wood, so he's probably a good-sized young man. Stay here with the donkey, he says to the servants, while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then, he says, we will come back. He fully believes that whatever happens, whether the boy dies, as Paul writes in the New Testament, Abraham believed that if his son died, that God would raise him up from the dead. Abraham's fully, fully believing this. He's fully believing that my son will come back. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire in the night. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, worst question of all time for a dad, yes, my son. Abraham replied, fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Meaning, God is going to provide a lamb. Even though I've been told to sacrifice you, that's not going to happen. Even though I will carry it out, this will not be the end result. The two of them went on together. When they reached the place that God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham then looked up, saw a thicket, saw there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, took the ram, and just like he expected to happen, he found the ram and sacrificed it as part of the burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. To this day, it is called, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. It, it's, most scholars think that Mount Moriah is where the temple is. That is the, the, the temple for modern day. Well, not this day. Now, the Dome of the Rock is there, but in Jerusalem, where the Jewish temple was, that is the uh, Mount Moriah. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time. And he said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and go, and through all the offspring of all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. And that's, you and me are in this verse. We are part of these nations. And nations to the ancient people here, they're, they're not meaning kind of like exactly, you know, nations with borders and political boundaries. They're talking about people groups. Uh, that's this idea of, you know, every ethnicity will be blessed because you have obeyed me. I mean, this is why this, I never was asked for this test. It was for all these nations' benefit. Because God has one plan. His plan is to live among his people. He can't accomplish that if he can't work through certain people to do so. And so he watches the, the human errors and the silliness and the stupid things that we do, and he works through it anyway, being consistent so that we can finally trust that he is unchanging. And because of that, we can change and be less weak than just trust that he will do what he said. Then Abraham returned to his servants, just like he had told them, 
And they set off together towards Be'er Shev. So Abraham stayed in Be'er Shev. Abraham does something that is kind of inhuman. When people don't like this story, they don't want to talk about it because in our modern sensibilities, this is, this is horrific. And it is. And that's the point. We should talk about it. We like to say that, you know, when we have faith and everything's going to just be all right. That we're all going to live comfortable, happy lives. We won't have any internal turmoil. We won't, we won't have, you know, deep sadness or deep depression. We won't experience loss. We won't have that feeling of, um, why am I here? We won't have sickness physically. We won't see death. We, we, we want to believe all these things are the case, but Christ promised the opposite. The opposite. He promised it would be hard, that it would be difficult. But He promised He would be there with you the entire time. And I would like to have heard something different that if you follow, like, three-step Jesus program that you're not going to have any more, any more problems. That would be really neat, and I would prefer it. But it's just not the case. It's going to be hard. He promised it. Um, what he's promising is something far greater. It's in the new heavens and new earth. It's where we will live forever doing what he made us to do. Doing the, every thing, every good desire in your heart, you will do. That's what we're waiting for. Can you have peace now? Yeah, you can. Um, can you trust that God is good to you now? Yes, but that doesn't mean everything will be easy. He does something other. It's an other thing. It's a, for a moment, he is in a sense holy, where he acts out what God would act out. And you'll see that in Christians too. You'll see a lot of failures. But with Christians, you'll see them occasionally doing something that is strange and unusual. And it's beautiful. And here we see Abraham doing it. He resisted every human impulse to save his own son. But instead, he completed. He, com he completely, sorry, submitted to God in faith that God would do the right thing. That's so hard to trust that God will do the right thing. It sounds dumb. Like how could the, like a pastor? How could anyone say just to trust God to do the right thing? Of course, if God is good, He'll do the right thing. But how hard is it to actually trust that God will do the right thing? Because we're so worried that He won't. If you really, really dig, dig, dig deep down the eye, like, like into our failures, it's because we really don't think we're going to be taken care of. We really don't think that, that God actually has it in his hands. That's why we do the things we do. That's why we mess up. Because we, when we get terrified, we, we find every way to solve it ourselves, to just follow human impulse. Abraham did not know exactly what God was doing, but he knew God. When they say the word, your only son, um, yeah, exactly. it's, it's this idea of your only one. When God said, take your only son, it literally is, take your only one. Your, your, your one and only, your only one, meaning, in a sense, that only thing that you actually care about in all the world, take that one and give it to me. Give it back to me. And Abraham did. That's why he is the father of faith. That's why he's our example. And God wants us to do the same thing. He wants us to be willing to give everything to him. That one and only thing that we care the most about, he wants us to just put it in his hand. Instead of Clutching it to ourselves and just following human impulse and human, human thought, human instinct. He wants us instead to follow 
and just trust that God has absolute control over that. The word Yehideka, your only one, your only son, is used to describe mourning for an only son or daughter who died. You'll see that sometimes. When they say your only one, its value is equivalent to a person's own life. It's not like, you know, um, you know, like a car you bought or a house you have. Obviously, you value such a thing because it has a high value. But it's talking about the level of thing that you consider irreplaceable that's more valuable than yourself. And for Abraham, Isaac was more valuable than, than Abraham. It was everything. It was the most precious possession. Yet, Abraham chose the giver of that rather than his one and only rather than that thing he died more than himself. He does it because he trusts God's goodness, God's promise. So my question for myself, for you, that you should think about. Do you, it's a silly question, but do you really um, answer often probably no, if you're a regular person. But hopefully as you get older, the answer is more often. Do you trust that God will do the right thing? Man, it's such a, such a question you would think that would be like an elementary kind of book, but, and yet this you know, stumbling block for, you know, I want every character in the Bible. Will I trust that God will do the right thing for me? Abraham, when he, when he failed, it was because he, he couldn't believe it. He thought he was going to be killed because of Sarah, and he would just, you know, I have a solution. I'm going to lie. He couldn't trust that God would do the right thing. If God's in control, will he do the right thing? Do you trust it? And here at the end of Abraham's life, he did. And that's our goal. We are shooting towards, towards this Genesis 22 with our own life. That's all of our goal. It's not some Christian's goal. It's not the pastor's goal. It's not, uh, you know, your grandmother's goal. It's, it's your goal. It has to be the Christian goal. Do I trust that God will do the right thing? And the answer should be yes, I trust that he will. Especially about that thing you value more than everything else. I'm going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're going to end here in a moment. Um, a couple more things to go through. The Lord, we ask that we could actually really understand this something not just to understand, but to act on. We pray this in Christ's name. We have a couple promises. I know. You can't control how it turns out. You can only do your best. You're responsible for obedience and everything else is not your problem. A couple promises, though, to remind you. Romans 1, verse 16 and 17, very clearly, God promised salvation. That's yours. You don't have to worry about it. It's not something you can do anything about. It, it, once it's yours, it's yours. It's given to you. Romans 2, verse 5. Chapter 5, verse 17. God promised believers new life in Christ. All the problems won't go away, but we can have new life. That's something we can experience. And in that new life, we still have problems. But there's a difference. 1 Peter 1, verse 4. A lot of these are future-oriented. The promise of the New Testament are mostly future-oriented. Inheritance is promised in heaven for believers. Not necessarily on earth. Matthew 6, Philippians 4, and Matthew 6 again. God is able to supply our needs. But that doesn't mean that he always does. He usually does. If you look at the people of faith, he usually 
provides our, our basic things we need. So much so that you should confidently ask, because he almost always does. But there are rare occasions where we will go hungry, and that is apparently our need at that time. It's rare, but it definitely happens. In verse 13, we're promised that we'll never be abandoned. We might be abandoned by men, might be abandoned by family, but we'll never be abandoned by God. You cannot trust God in big ways. This is where we end. You can't trust God in big ways. Don't take him right now in small risks in obedience. You can't start at Abraham um, in Genesis 22. You start in Genesis 12. Where it says, Abraham, uh, there's some place I have for you. Go on. Kind of a, not even a whole lot of information there. Just, I trust you enough to do that. And he does. But then we get to Genesis 22. It says, give me the only thing that you value more than your own life. And Abraham says, okay, I trust you. You can't get there unless you start taking some small risks to just obey him. And his commands and the New Testament. So we'll stop here for real this time, and we'll pray. Dear Father, again, we look at Abraham's life, and uh, we see the end there. That's Abraham's faith is amazing, but it's just because he he saw how gracious you are consistently, how you will do anything for Abraham. You'll just keep, keep doing what he said. Keep being true to who you are, even as we are true to ourselves, unfortunately. We mess up and do lots of things we never should. We, we pray that we can see Abraham as our example in Genesis 22, that we're willing to give up the one and only thing we just can't let go of. Pray that we can even find out what that thing is. Because uh, I think a lot of times we're, you know, I think we're not really thinking clearly all the time, we're just living in reactive mode. I pray that we can see the things that we're not giving God, and especially the things that we, we value more than ourselves, and just be willing to let go and trust you with that. That's probably that that's something that you would do to work in the hearts of the people here today. I pray this.